as an segment of the industry, the sustainable agriculture part of the industry is way behind conventional in using biocontrols, way behind, and it's really a shame. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, we need to get going on this, we need to catch up on it, and there's a few really good reasons. First, resistance. Okay, the insects are quicker than us, they're more fertile than us, obviously, and they are developing resistance fast, even and especially to the chemicals that we're allowed to use, the softer chemicals, because we continuously use them. Okay, we use the same things over and over and over again, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So we have to learn that there's not a ton of stuff that's really instantly effective coming down the pipeline from anybody. Okay, there's a lot of new things coming along, but they're all biologically re uh, related or extracted, uh, and they're a little bit slower. They take a while to get going. They have very re specific requirements to get them going to work for you. They're very effective. They're very wonderful, but it's not, there's no magic bullet that you walk in there see an outbreak of aphids, throw something on your back, and go out there and spray them and they're gone and you can harvest lettuce the next day. There just is nothing like that in food production. And there shouldn't be, by the way, <laughs> you know, that's a good thing. So we've been doing this for a, a, quite a while and I'll go through this. So what I'm talking about here is what I call biocontrols from sow to sell or from cutting to sale, however you want to look at it. You know, we are a, a, a commercial and wholesale greenhouse company. Uh, we've got a fair amount of land as well that we're, looking, that we're looking hungrily at right now. But we do biocontrols from before a crop is ever in that greenhouse all the way through the production cycle, all the way to the end when it's either sold or shipped or cut or eaten or whatever it is. Okay, so it is 100% in. Even the stuff that we're still permitted to use legally, we're not using them anymore. And there's a simple reason for it. And I'll get into that later, but the simple reason is they don't work anymore. They just don't work. Even more, they're devastating to my biocontrol program. Okay, they, they basically turn it off for us for a number of weeks. And we're just not willing to do that. So what I'm really talking about is true chemical free growing and organic system approach. And I'm not in any way, shape, or, for, or form saying if you're not organic, you ain't Jack Diddley. I'm not saying that at all. It just happens to be the, the avenue that we've taken. And I will also say that in many cases, organic and sustainable are in direct opposition to each other. And I'll give you a couple examples of that later. It's also part of the problem of what we're doing right now as well. And uh, there's a few reasons for that. And the primary one is because now it's protected agriculture. You know, wow, we've got control over the rain and the irrigation and the fertilizer and the sun and the heat and all this other good stuff, at least some control in a high tunnel but we're also protecting the insects, okay? And that's really important. So when you're in a greenhouse situation and you're in production all year round, so are the insects, okay? And the insects that are the bad guys are much more amenable. They don't care nearly as much about winter and day length and stuff like that compared to the beneficials, okay? So it's really we're creating this, this hard situation that we've got to figure out and that we've got to solve. Okay, so it's, it's protected ag for bugs too. And you can see we've got seed sowing, we've got uh, vegetative cuttings, there's, you know, it's all sorts of different things that are going on uh, in the greenhouses. And you know, we're, we're pretty dedicated to this. We live this as, just like any farmer does. This is exactly what we're doing, you know, is, it's, it's 52 weeks a year, 365 days, you know, and every day somebody is there. So propagation, of course, is all about managing your environment. 
okay? It's the hardest part of horticulture. Um, you know, if you have a good stand of seedlings, you know, you're going to do pretty well. If you have, you know, we always say in the seed room when they're sowing, we say, you know, if there's no seed in that cell, it's going to be pretty hard to germinate it, you know? It's going to be pretty hard. And if there's no plant in that cell, it's going to be really hard to sell it to somebody. And so when you start looking at things like that, to say it's all about that germination, it is the hardest thing we do is germinating a seed. You know, it is, there's so many things that you can do, do wrong because you've got all these different environments that you've got to be managing, okay? And of course, I don't care what it is, it's all about the soil, okay? It's always about the soil. I don't care what you grow, it's always about the root system that you put on. If you have good roots, you have good shoots. Okay, and that's just a truism. You know, it, that you can't do it without a good root system. So we are looking at moisture levels in that soil, oxygen levels, very important. I'll show you an example of that later. Pore space, uh, and we're really looking at the vascular interface of that new root and the soil surface that it's adhering to. Okay, that's where all the activity, everything a plant does, is based on that little sheath, you know, right where that soil and the root hairs contact it. It's the only part of a plant that really matters. And it's all intense. It's by far the most energy intensive, light intensive, management intensive, capital intensive, all of that stuff. It's all about that, 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 that germination and all, to get this germination, okay? And part of this is controlling diseases, controlling the insects, controlling all of this first. And I'll show a couple quick examples. Uh, we multi-sow lettuces, uh, depending on which type, whether it's a heading or whether it's a leaf lettuce. Uh, but we obviously single sow all the vegetables, the, all the brassicas and things like that are all single sown. Um, but the reason why we spend so much time and so much energy and so much capital on this optimized environment is, it, and this is like the perfect example of why. Yes, ma'am. When you're pushing your plants, are we losing anything by speeding it up nutritionally or? It's a, it's a, a very fair question. What she's, what she's asking is when we push the plant, um, are we losing anything in terms of nutrient value or anything? First of all, they're very young plants. So we're not, you know, the nutrient value, unless we're doing microgreens, is not an issue at this point. And when I say we're pushing them, I don't mean like we're forcing them at really high temperatures. I mean what we're doing is we're getting them up to that point, up to that point, and those plants will already be, like that bench is already in an environment that is running about 45 degrees, okay, at night. Okay, so we're hardening them already at that point because we know where people are going to put these plants. They're going to go right out, you know. And, uh, and, and I should also mention that the roofs of the greenhouse open up to the sky. So, uh, you know, it, it, and it's glass. So, you know, so it's a pretty tough plant when you get it. And, uh, but anyway, it's uniformity. I want every plant in every tray to be identical to every other plant in it. We do that with the boom systems computer-controlled booms that missed according to the environment, not according to the time of day. It's all based on temperature, light levels, uh, relative humidity, uh, and a couple of other measurements. Uh, when I was at Cornell in graduate school, that's what I did my thesis on, was the what's called vapor pressure deficit. Uh, and we wrote a computer program that would control misting for propagation according to set points that we would determine uh, for vapor pressure deficit, or the amount of water that a plant or seedling requires that it's not getting because it has no roots. So you have to provide that water to that plant on the surface of it to replace what it's not getting through its roots, because it doesn't have any roots at that point. So it's pretty cool, and that's, the, that's part of the computer control for that. This makes no difference whether you're a gigantic operation or whether you're a very small operation. Okay, the, the, the rules follow. You know, it's amazing what's going on in the scientific world. So again, I, can, I continuously push this concept of uniformity. Okay, as a farmer, as a grower, for what you're trying to do, uniformity is a key component of what you do. If you start out with uniform plants, 
you will end up you know, in a field with very uniform plants. Some real world stuff. Okay, so we're growing transplant for a lot of different growers all over the country. So we're looking, again, we're looking for a full tray actively growing for you. We're USDA certified organic. And again, I'm going to emphasize this, oftentimes this is the opposite of what you want to do for sustainability. Okay, they're not the same thing at all. And my favorite example is Pyganic. Okay, I just, I just, you know, I love when people say, oh, I pull out the Pyganic and I spray it. Well, that's OMRI approved, you know, it's okay. And my son always calls this the nuclear option, okay? It is the nuclear option because it kills stuff. I mean, make no mistake about it, it kills stuff. But it kills everything. It kills all your beneficials, all of them. They're gone. And they don't come back for a long time. And what you find is when you start going in with Pyganic or something like that, three weeks later, you know, you killed some aphids, but now you can't control spider mites because you killed all your beneficials. Or you can't control thrips anymore. Or you can't control something else because all that whole balance is now gone. It's been destroyed and you did it to yourself. I call it shooting yourself in the foot. And one thing you'll learn as you start going down the, the pathway of biocontrols is you will shoot yourself in the foot. You have to accept that. You're just going, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to do boneheaded things. You're going to slap your head. Oh, I can't believe I just did that. Uh, and it'll happen. You know, you also have to accept the fact that you're going to have outbreaks. They're insects. You know, they're insects. They're coming back. So you're going to do this. So the nuclear option for us, you know, is truly the nuclear option. I mean, it is, it is going to kill everything that's out there. Spinosad. Okay, there's a number of different spinosads. Uh, the conventional one is usually called conserve. The organic one is called entrust. Um, entrust is what, Alex, maybe five times more expensive than the conventional one. Why? Because they can. And, uh, you know, we all know that they're, they're, you know, they kill you on all the organic stuff. Spinosad does not work anymore on thrips. It is absolutely useless on thrips because we have used it over and over and over and over. And there are states that have now removed thrips from the Spinosad labels. Okay, but we keep using it. You know, and it doesn't work. It's great on lepidopterans and stuff like that, but for what we really want to spray it on, it just doesn't work anymore. So now, what we used to be our primary is now off the table. Can't be used anymore. Okay, and that's a big issue. Anybody ever have a thrip problem on a crop? You come on, raise your hands, be honest about it. Yeah, exactly. So some practical realities. We're talking about insect and disease control here. And the simple reality is pests are forever, okay? They are, they, are, they are not going anywhere. So what we're looking at now for our strategies is IPM, Integrated Pest Management, and Biocontrols. Part of that means that you have to learn the life cycles of these insects, the susceptible stages of life of these insects. You know, there are times when something that you can do to them is effective. And there's many more life stages where it simply is not effective whatsoever. On thrips in particular, the eggs are kind of immune to everything. Uh, the first larva instar is susceptible to some things. Uh, chemicals, yes, and many of your biologicals. Second larval instar is, is uh, exposed to certain things. The pupa, not very, not very exposed, you know. So you, now you've got to start looking at what is my life stage of this insect and decide what application you're going to make if you're applying a chemical or what predators are going to work for this thing at what stage. Okay, so it's a science. It's not random. It's not just, you know, somebody says, oh, just use that on thrips or that on aphids and throw it out there in the greenhouse and expect to have great results. It doesn't work that way. Okay, it is a, it is a, you've got to learn the system and trust the bug. So how do you switch? When you're making the change, 
There are certain things that you have to go through as a company, and I mean the entire company. This is not, unless you're a one-person operation, this is not as simple as just saying, we're, we're switching over to biocontrols. Okay, that means that you've made that decision as a grower or as a manager. That means everybody else in that company has to buy into this concept as well. It is a total system approach, and that starts before the plants ever get into the greenhouse, and it continues with every aspect of everything that you do. It includes sanitation in the greenhouse, your water supply, how you treat your water, uh, it, you know, sp spraying, not spraying, whether you're using the predators, whether you're using banker, it, everything. It all fits in there together. You can really only prevent problems. You do not solve problems. You know, if you're in a greenhouse and you're growing tomatoes, and you're looking at your tomato crop and they've got, you know, if they've got white fly all over them, you are not going to fix that with biologicals. You have to stop that swarm from starting up on the plant. So you got to be way, way, way ahead of that plant, of that problem. And it is the first line of defense always. You know, in other words, you're dedicating yourself to this program. You know, there's a lot of presentations that go on all over the country, primarily in uh, uh, conventional venues, where they have topics that are, uh, you know, basically, the, I, I don't, you know, they have good titles for it, but basically what they're saying is sprays you can live with and, uh, you know, that your biologicals will put up with. And the answer is that there's not much, you know, so it's you really want to stay away as much as possible from the sprays and if you're going to spray something it has to be a very specific target a very specific insect that you're trying to eliminate in a discrete area and the new chemistries the the um, insect eating uh, fungi and things like that and and the new chemicals that are like feeding inhibitors and growth regulators for insects are very, very, very laser focused now. Um, you know, so we're, we're going to have to live with this system. Uh, and actually, it's the only one that has a long-term viability. It's the only one that actually is sustainable. Keys to success. Okay, so the first one is delegate responsibility and accountability. You have to make somebody responsible for this program. Somebody's got to do it. And they've got to be the one who runs it, who makes the recommendations, who implements it, keeps the records, all of that stuff. They have to be responsible for that program. If you say you're all going to take care of this problem and this and that, then nobody does it. Okay, nobody will actually do it. So it's all about that responsibility and accountability for it. Look at what past problems you have in your, in your operation already. And especially look at the short term. And when I say you're looking at the short term, you know, in other words, it's getting warm out now. We're going to start to see aphids. We're going to, you know, you, you have to know the cycles of your insect life in there. And consistent scouting. In our company, everybody scouts. You know, I, I like to see people walking around with a lens. Your hand lens is your best friend and you should always have a good lens available to you. Uh, we have a number of a small, lighted, uh, low-powered microscope that, that, ca that are carried around so that you can ha always have something at, uh, at hand to see something. You know, it really tells you a lot when you can get right down on that leaf and see what type of mite it is or what type of aphid it is and identify them. So good lenses are your best friend. I also say that if you're going to have a, a, a dedicated scout in your company, your grower should not be the scout. Okay, people squawk when I say that. And, and what I say is, is that the grower, if they're a good grower, is too close to the crop. They see it too often. And they're not going to detect a very slight change or a plant that just doesn't look quite right. It takes a fresh set of eyes to go in there and say, that's, that's a problem over there. Okay, but the grower who is going up and down every bench or every house or every bed or row all day, every day, just simply may not see that nuance. Okay, and it's just the way it is. So make somebody else responsible for that job and train them. 
train them to identify. Okay, you're going to have to start at some point. You're, you're going to have to you know, decide this is the date that we're doing it. That's your decision. That's based on your knowledge, your crop cycle, what you're growing, when you start the crop, of course. You know, so in a normal winter, it would be great to have the house or the tunnel completely fallow now, completely cleaned up, all the weeds gone out of it you know, over the winter, maybe disinfected uh, now, and then start off very, very clean right before your crops come in in the spring. That's the perfect time to do it. This is the worst winter possible to be doing that, of course, because it just hasn't been cold. You know, it just has not been cold enough to really do any damage in an unheated house. You know, so you, this, we're, we're wondering what we're going to see this spring, I, and I really wonder what's going to happen outdoors. Ma'am. Can you discuss how you disinfect your houses? I can discuss how we disinfect our houses. Um, I'm going to give you a little dirty secret um, that when we first, with, years ago, when we first uh, started on the biological control program, and it's just not something you can do anymore, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, um, many years ago when we decided to do this, the recommendation from the biological, the beneficial insect company was, he said, get yourself some nicofume, nicotine. Okay, and he said, bomb the house. Okay, no, I'm serious. Like, it has zero residual. It's done, it's gone, and it kills everything. And he said, you will start out with a clean house, you know, and it's true. It's absolutely true. It, it goes and it's gone, literally, as soon as, the, as soon as the smoke is gone. And you can go right back into that house. It's amazing. You can't get that stuff anymore, obviously. So now you're faced with, and there's nothing I'm going to recommend that's a chemical, chemical, you know, like that. We go through, we have a foaming device. It creates a thick uh, foam of sanidate or zero tol, uh, zero tolerance. It's a peroxide, uh, OMRI approved peroxide product. Uh, and the, the foam generator is nice because it coats everything and it stays there. You know, and, and it goes away slowly as opposed to just spraying it uh, where it's gone in a few minutes. Okay, so that's, that's your first big step on it. Second step is, you know, before you do that, every weed has got to be gone. Every single weed has got to go. Okay, here's truism number one. If you have weeds, you have insects. I don't care how clean you think you are. You have insects if you have weeds. And you look under a bench or in a ground bed, in a corner, you know, right where the greenhouse corner is or something like that, and there's those little weeds growing in there, that's where your insects are coming from. All that stuff has got to go. It's just got to go. Okay. Uh, but we're, we're, we're actually solid concrete. So it's hard for weeds to come up in concrete, you know. So that, that was it. But anyway, so that's what, you know, is like you've got to get rid of your weeds, you start off clean with nothing in that greenhouse. You disinfect every surface that you can get to uh, before you bring a plant into that greenhouse. So it's critical to start out clean. Okay, you start biological controls in the propagation. Okay, that means if you're buying transplants from somebody, you need to know what they're doing to those transplants. So it is an entirely fair question for you to demand, if you're buying transplants from somebody, what has been put on these transplants? What, you know, have you used any growth regulators? Have you used any chemicals? Is there anything that's residual? And you need to make a decision on who you purchase from or who you use, unless you're raising your own, oftentimes based on that. And that is becoming a very common question that people will ask, is what's your insect control program? What's your disease control program? before you buy and transplant from somebody. So it's a very, very, very fair question. Propagation is the most dense of all the productions. And so as if you get the biologicals and the predators there, when you spread them out and transplant them, the biologicals go <coughs> with them. OK, so that's a big plus. If you can work with somebody who's doing it right from the propagation stage, 
We utilize banker and trap plants. I'll show you examples of both of those. We grow insects. We grow, we buy aphids. <laughs> we, we pay really good money to buy aphids. And we grow those aphids on specific plants so that the predators have a food source. So we grow the predators on that. And I'll show you pictures of that later too. And again, don't give up. You will have outbreaks. You will suffer. It'll be, it'll get ugly before it gets pretty again, uh, but you have to keep it up. You can't give up. Uh, don't kill yourself. And again, there's a tipping point, and I'll show you some great graphics of that later, uh, where, you, where you can see this battle is on, and then pretty quickly you see the battle is over. Okay? It's really neat. So you got to start early, and you got to be in front of any issues. You got to be way out in front of it. Uh, this is not a picture from our greenhouse. Uh, I have plant pathologists who shudder when they see this picture, but we like to dip our plants before we plant them. So when, when cuttings and things are coming into the greenhouse, they are submerged completely in a solution of beneficial nematodes, root shield plus, and botanogard. Okay, so you have an entomophagous uh, insecticide with the botanogard. You've got a biological fungicide with the root shield plus. Uh, and you've got beneficial nematodes, which are not affected by either of those. Uh, and they're going, they're, they're going after fungus gnat larvae and thrips and things like that. It's a unique opportunity very, very early that you have to apply 100% coverage. It's the only opportunity you will ever have in your production scheme to get 100% coverage. Okay, ma'am, I'll come back to you. At what stage would you do that if you're starting from seed yourself? You, you can't do it from seed, okay, because then your seeds are all wet and all that kind of stuff. We would do it, for, our first stage to do that would be as an unrooted cutting that's going to get tr uh, stuck in a cube to be rooted. So we literally will take the bag of cuttings and submerge that completely. And the second stage where you can do that is when you have a tray of transplants or rooted cuttings or even seedlings, and you can submerge that tray before it gets transplanted outside or in a pot or in the ground or something like that. So you, you have a very limited number of, of, of times that you get to do that. Okay, so you really got to take advantage of those times. That was, you would, that was my question. Okay, too. yeah. Before a transplant, you said like, like the day before you transplanted? Like, like, a, like minute a minute before oh, you transplanted, no. you know, like as close to it as you can do it. And, uh, Root shield, that's a uh, fungicide? It, a biological fungicide, yes. Does it affect the the uh, Not at all. Okay. Not at all. You just submerge it, you know, you don't have to leave it under there for 10 minutes or anything like that uh, and then get it, get it back out. I mean, yes? I just wanted to know what protection you were getting from this combination. What, what protection? Well, okay, so the protections that we're getting are we are putting the, an insect eating fungus on that plant uh, that covers every surface of it. So if there's an egg or a larva of a soft-bodied insect on it, it will be in direct contact with those fungal spores. And it's the best chance you're ever going to get to get it inoculated. And it's wet, which, the fun the, which that fungus likes a lot. Okay, root shield also works on the, on the surface layer of the plant. It's not quite the best time to do root shield, because nor you think root shield, well, it kind of depends on roots, doesn't it? Uh, but it does have some effectiveness as a surface, uh, a contact surface uh, agent as well. Okay, and then the, uh, the uh, nematodes, um, a lot of times when you get a mix, you know, if you're doing a compost-based mix or even a commercial mix, the, uh, you know, the, another dirty little secret of, of horticulture is, you know, your, your commercial mixes, they have fungus gnat larvae in them already most of the time. It's unfortunate, but it's absolutely true. We've had, we've had a run-in with a, a commercial mix uh, not very, very long ago that literally you would, you would open up the, the pallet and you would see fungus gnats on the bags. You know, it's like that is just not acceptable, you know, and, uh, but they're, they're there. I mean, no question about it, they're there. 
unless you're steam sterilizing your soil, which kills all your biology anyway, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have to deal with that issue. You know, fungus gnats are pretty fertile and uh, there's, you know, and they're, and they're nasty. I mean, man, you let fungus gnats get out of control, it is over. Forget cucurbits, you know, because they will, they will just kill your cucurbits completely. You know, it's, it's horrible. They're disgusting little things. And uh, um, so anyway, the nematodes are very effective. They love fungus gnat larvae. Um, and they also, there is evidence and uh, it's more than anecdotal evidence. There is scientific evidence that the uh, nematodes, the Steiner nema feltii, works on thrip larva. Uh, it, all, it definitely works on thrip pupa. And uh, if you're doing regular applications of uh, Steiner nema, the, the beneficial nematodes, in your seed beds and stuff like that, you're a long way away, or a long way going towards uh, controlling fungus gnats completely. Okay, so it, it really is an effective, by far the most effective thing on them. So again, the predators are applied when or before the plants are going into the greenhouse or into a production field. Okay, and we have Root Shield incorporated into, our, into all of our soil. So every plant that ever gets planted has Root Shield applied to it before we plant it. It's good stuff, you know. And uh, there's a new version, Root Shield Plus, which is actually two different uh, biologies in there. Um, it's a little bit, it's a, we look at Root Shield Plus as the summertime mix. Regular Root Shield is a wintertime mix. And it's primarily, um, and I'm sure Steve will correct me on this, but the work, it's primarily on pythium or water molds. Uh, and there's, there's different strains that live at different times of year or predominate at different times of year. Okay, and so the summertime mix and the wintertime mix are a little bit different, a diff little bit different uh, effectiveness on that. So uh, root shield is great stuff. We also use these, what are called a sachet. Okay, and that's like a six week treatment uh, of the uh, predatory mites in that. You stick them in the trays. There's a great picture there of uh, them in the trays. Um, you know, when you think about, yeah, you know, it's not cheap and all that, it's about 10 cents a sachet. Uh, for, you know, for several weeks of coverage, but when you take a, a, a full tray of cuttings or seedlings, that's a valuable piece of real estate for you. Ten cents to uh, prevent disease or insect issues on that is pretty cheap. You know, it's, that's, that's a pretty cheap insurance policy on that. And then when you go into larger pots, let's say you're growing tomatoes in pots or, or, or whatever you're growing, you can put one of those in every, in every big pot. You know, if you're growing big rosemaries or gingers or stuff like that, you put one of those in every pot because once those pots are separated and spaced, the mites have no way to go from pot to pot after that time. They're mites, you know, they're little tiny things. And it's a long way to go three feet from pot to pot. You know, so you just put them everywhere, ma'am. Uh, I, is there a brand name that I prefer? Um, there are three main companies that produce the bulk of the biologicals uh, in the world. Copert, uh, Syngenta, and Biobest. They're all good companies. It's not about the company or the brand of them. They're all, uh, Cucumerus is Cucumerus. They're the same thing. It's about the technical people who back you up. Okay, the, the technical expert who gives you the advice on when and where and what and how many is far more valuable than any price difference or anything like that with the bugs. Okay, so it's, it's about the experts. Uh, it's far more important. Okay, I, I don't know any other way to be more, you know, so for me to recommend a particular company that happens to be my choice uh, because based on our knowledge of the technical people and the quality of their uh, product, but they're all, they're all pretty good or they wouldn't be able to stay in business. So, you know, it, it, that's a real good, real fancy way of not answering your question. Uh, but the name is all over these uh, slides, so you'll be able to read it at some point. Um, okay, so bugs always come back. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. They're, they're, they're better than us. They're faster than us. You know, they always figure us out because they're filthy, disgusting bugs. Okay. <laughs> So, and, you know, and again, the biggest issue, really, the most ongoing issue that everybody fights is aphids. 
Okay, aphids, man, they are, they are just tough. I mean, look at this. And, and it looks horrifying, you know, when you first look at it, it's like, oh my God, this thing is covered with aphids, until you realize that about 95% of those are parasitized and are actually hatching out new predators that are flying around our greenhouse. But it sure is ugly, isn't it? You know, I mean, they are fertile. Man, do they come on in big numbers. And so each one of these things is what's called an aphid mummy. That's a, that has a parasite living in it. You can see some red ones still. They're still alive and moving around, or they may have been parasitized, but they're not dead yet. Uh, and then the thing you want to really start looking at is these guys. These guys here, see the long, narrow things that are all over the place? That's an insect called a Phytalides. And that is an aphid slaughterer. Oh my God, are they wonderful to have around the greenhouse. We release them. And they will, they, they kind of sneak up under aphids. It's a, it's a maggot, actually, they're tiny. And they bite them on their knee. They do, I mean, this is true, I can't, I'm not making this stuff up. They bite them on the knee and suck the juice out of them. Oh, it's awesome. It's the best thing ever, you know? I mean, that's what they do. And they, you know, they, they, they kill many aphids every day. So you look at this, you look at this picture, you know, and there it is about three, four days later. Okay, so here the battle is clearly on. This battle is on. But when you see that number, I mean, there's got to be five or six aphidolites larvae in there. You have five or six aphidolites larvae on that one leaf. That battle is done. It's going to get ugly. It's not going to be pretty for a while, but they will eat those aphids. Sir, in the back. When you recognize a plant with these parasites on it, um, do you leave the plant where it is? Do you move it so that the parasites get a chance to move around the greenhouse, or do you sequester it? That's a great question. First of all, they're, they're good flyers. The, uh, the predators are pretty good flyers, so they will move. Okay, And, and I'll show you the banker plants because we have banker plants in very specific locations and they do get pretty much all over the greenhouse. So they will fly around and hunt. The trick is not making the banker plant so wonderful for them that they don't go anywhere else. Because we, depending on what the plant is, we will keep plants that are, that we can see this happening on, even though we know we're gonna, we're never gonna sell that plant you know, because it'll, it'll be deformed or ugly or whatever, but, you know, you don't throw away something that's got thousands of, uh, of aphid mummies on it because that's a valuable commodity. You know, I spend time and effort growing those things, so. Uh, this one is a Phytolides aphidomyza. Yeah, it's a lot of Latin stuff. It's, it, no, no, it is not. It's, a, it's a, actually a, a midge, a fly, a diptera. And then you start to see this one here is just turning tan a little bit, so he's gotten he's got nag in him, or she's got nag in him is more likely. Okay, then they turn this pale brown color. That's fully mummified at that point. Okay, that that that's got an, a, a larva of a new uh, a, a, a phidias growing in it. And then you see the ones that have the little holes chewed in their butt. It's a perfectly circular hole chewed in the butt. And that's where the uh, uh, aphidias has now crawled out, looking to mate. If it's a female, she's going to start laying eggs, okay, as fast as she can. Okay, surfid flies. Okay, anybody see hover, you know, hover flies? You see them out in your fields all the time. It's like a little tiny miniature bee, little tiny thing, not tiny, but you know, it's very much smaller than a, a, a real bee. It's not a bee at all, okay? And they have this unique, very distinctive uh, flying pattern where they're sort of bouncing around like this and all that. They're good guys. They're really, really, really good guys. We are always happy when we see surfeit flies come around. They're a natural predator. They're everywhere outdoors. Okay, and that's what the larva looks like of a surfeit fly. And the first thing you do when you see something like that is say, crap, I've got caterpillars. Right? First thing you do, I've got caterpillars. And if you're not, you know, careful with it, you get out a sprayer and you spray them. 
and you just killed all your predators, all right? So it's the stupidest thing you can do, shoot yourself in the foot. This is one of those cases where it's real easy to get yourself confused if you haven't figured this stuff out. And I literally saw, I had on those basils that were so horrifying, here I am saying, oh my God, this is the end of the world. And then I see this thing on them, and it's like, great, now I've got caterpillars too, right? And then I look, I say, but they're not eating anything. They're not, there's no holes in the leaves. There's no, there's no feces on the leaves. You know, what's going on? And then I started watching them. And they have a very distinctive hunting and feeding pattern where they will, they sort of like wave around and they tap the leaf. They're tapping and they tap. And then they'll go under the leaf and tap. And then they come out and when they see, when they come across an aphid, they'll rear up and they come down on it and jam it. They, they, they pierce it, you know, and they, they'll wave up in the air carrying this aphid around yeah, and all that kind of stuff. It's oh, it's awesome. Video. It's amazing. <laughs> and they suck it out and then you fling it away and go for another one. <laughs> I'm telling you, these guys are nasty. They're mean, you know, and they're your best friend in the greenhouse. Okay, so here you can see that. Now you've got a surfed fly larva underneath doing that tapping thing. Okay, really cool to see these guys working. And when you start looking at your crops, you're going to see this stuff is there already if you're not spraying. Okay, that's the key, is to just get away from the sprayer, and you'll start to see these guys all over the place. Okay, ladybugs. Okay, so here's, here's a little clump of ladybug, ladybird beetle. And the first thing they do is they turn from where they are and they go running down. And they Literally, they'll all turn and go running down into the heart of the plant. Lacewings. Okay, we release lacewing larvae in the greenhouses. Um, you know, you want something that is aggressive and a brutal hunter. That's what they look like up close. Yeah, you would not want to be an aphid when that guy is around. I'm telling you. These are friends, you know, and these are all natural predators. They're out there for you already. And there's one with an aphid. See it? Right there, man. He's got that thing and he is just done. It's over. Okay, banker plants. And this is kind of like the secret weapon. Okay, they're really good for aphids. And the first thing you got to do is realize that there's exceptions. There's 300 different species of aphids. 300 of them. Wow, that's a lot. And it's very important because all the different aphids have a different set of predators that work on them. Okay, and that's really important to remember. So you may think you have, you know, somebody recommends you get the uh, Aphidius colmani and you're done with your aphid control. Well, it's not that simple, not at all. Okay, because the potato aphid, and I'm sure you guys have seen potato aphids, Aphidius colmani does not work on potato aphids. They're too big, okay, for them. And the one that's really the toughest one is what's called the red morph, the red morph of the green peach aphid. So, oh, it's a green peach aphid? No, it's red, but it's still a peach aphid. They have a unique thing where the standard predators just don't bother them. Chemicals are quite ineffective on them. Um, so you have to do a different group of predators just for the red morph. You know, and you got, you, there's no book that tells you this stuff, unfortunately. You got to learn this stuff. So this is a banker plant uh, where you grow, uh, it's called the bird cherry oat aphid. It grows only on grasses. It does not attack any broadleaf uh, plants at all. So it, we grow them on rye or wheat or barley. Uh, we kind of switch back and forth on them. There's times when barley just doesn't do well for us. Sometimes when wheat doesn't do well, um, but you know you're you're looking at that and you can see here it's a black aphid, and then you can see they've been parasitized. You have to grow them in a screened area to protect them from the predators, because the predators will get in there and they'll ruin your banker system. You have to continuously grow these banker plants and inoculate them with these aphids that you're paying for. And, uh, and, and keep them growing. Okay, so then now, now we're growing them here in the greenhouse. This is a, uh, a cover, or I'm sorry, a strainer. We buy these at Sherwin-Williams. 
a strainer for five gallon paint cans, okay? And they have an elastic band on them and they fit around a 12 inch hanging basket. We have found now that we have to double them up. They have a very short lifespan because the elastic gets stretched and the aphidias will find a way to get in there, believe me. We double them up because we were finding that the aphidias were uh, shoving their ovipositor through the mesh and, and, and clipping the aphids that way. Okay, so they're, they're aggressive. They want to be there. But that's how we're growing uh, banker plants in the greenhouse now. And I would highly recommend that you consider doing all this work in a remote location if you can, not in the greenhouse, because again, you want to keep the predators away. A lot of times you'll, they'll, people will use compressed air to blow off the outside of the cage just to keep the aphidias off. So it's, a, it's a, like I said, it, it, it attacks cereals only. If you're the organic grain grower, it's not the one for you, okay? So some people have a basement grow room. You know, we're now, uh, whenever they're, uh, making new bankers or, or, or putting them together, uh, they actually always take the cart of plants into the boiler room. Because you feel there's probably no reason for there to be a, a bunch of aphidias back there. Okay, so just to remind you, you know, this is, this is, aphids are by far the toughest one. They're everywhere, there's so many different ones, and you just gotta, you just gotta learn your aphids. There's ways that you can identify them. Trap plants and guardian plants are, are a very effective way to do it. Uh, this happens to be a, a picture of, th these are milkweed aphids or oleander aphids. You see them all over milkweeds out in the field. They're brilliant yellow, uh, pretty big. When you see one, you'll see a million of them at the same time. And they have a, a black cornicle. The two horns that come off the back of the aphid are black. They're actually a beautiful insect. It's a really cool color. Um, they, they're not particularly harmful, it's just that there's always so many of them. You know, and they're very host specific. But we would leave that plant there uh, in the greenhouse because that's going to be a trap plant. In other words, you're going to, if you have a plant that they will go to, they will find that plant and they will go to that plant. Uh, some new banker systems, this is one that we're doing right now for whitefly. Um, so if you're a tomato grower, this is pretty cool stuff, or an eggplant grower. This is a, a plant we're all familiar with in a very, very bad way. Uh, it's mullen, okay, the common field mullen, verbascum, verbascum thapsus, actually. And we grow mullen in the greenhouse to grow insects on them, okay, we're for just that purpose. It's important that you sow your own seed and keep it actively growing, never let it get cold, never let it think it's been through a winter because it's a true biennial. It'll go into bloom. It's useless once it goes into bloom. So we, we keep them juvenile for this purpose. And that's what it looked like early on. It is just covered with pest insects because you're looking down there. This is the disiphus. They're quite large. They're very aggressive. They're very strong flyers. And there it is, you know, right out in the middle of a crop of poinsettias. You know, again, for white fly control. Okay, it's really effective. It's really been pretty good for us. And I, and I said, we would not put these plants out there if we didn't believe that they were going to control the insect issue. You know, you don't move plants that have aphids into your greenhouse unless you're pretty confident in the system that you're working with it. Thrips. Ooh. Okay, thrips are really tough. They're, first of all, they develop resistance almost overnight to everything. There's nothing coming in the pipeline that's effective on them, really. Um, and controlling thrips without banker plants is, is, in my opinion, almost impossible. So we grow these plants. Um, this is a, a, a black, I'm sorry, a purple flash pepper. We used to grow them with this lobularia or alyssum on it. Uh, and what we found was that the, the lobularia was extremely attractive to thrips. You know, so they would be just covered with thrips. You'll see that out in California a lot. They'll ring strawberry fields with alyssum, okay, as a, a biocontrol that pulls, that pulls them away from the strawberries. This is a much more typical view. We're doing just the flash pepper now. Uh, the flash pepper is very, very good for growing a particular insect uh, called aureus. It's a minute plant bug, pirate bug, 
and they're vicious thrip hunters. They'll kill 80 thrips a day. Uh, they kill them for fun. Uh, they do. I mean, they do. They will, they will, they're aggressive. They'll, they'll kill anything they can catch. Um, but they, they do love thrips in particular. And uh, they're, they're pretty effective. Once you get a good crop of aureus bankers going, uh, in the summertime in particular, you really, they're like a, a, like a, a motor, like an engine of thrip killing. So they will, they will get really effective. We like to place them above the crop uh, because they're good flyers. Um, we will sometimes back away from just using banker plants and release aureus in, in known hot spots. Okay, if you have a, a plant Thyme is an example, rosemary is another example of plants that thrips just migrate towards. Um, you might want to consider releasing aureus right there, okay, instead of, build, instead of growing these uh, uh, banker plants. You have to be way ahead of it. It's a 26-week cycle from sow to having a full-blown banker plant on the, on the purple flash pepper. So if you're thinking for this spring, you already missed the boat. Okay, it's too late. You got to do that in the fall and grow them through the winter. And so we grow, you know, transplants that we sell to other growers uh, of the black pearl or, or the jet purple flash pepper, um, you know, that are known to be clean without any residue or anything like that on them so that you can be ahead of the game. Um, they go dormant in the winter time, which is why it's so hard to keep them going. Diapause is when the days get short, they stop recreating. And so what we do is we have a light system in the greenhouse, a, a high-pressure sodium light that rotates. Okay, it goes back and forth because they're actually, you can see it, you, actually that's the lamp right there. That's the reflector. And it rotates around the bulb. And it moves a swath of light across the greenhouse intermittently. The reason we do that is the aureus are attracted to the light and they fly up into regular HID lights and they burn up like Icarus. Okay, they just get too close to them and it's too hot and they die. Okay, and so what we, what uh, the theory is, and Al, I, have you substantiated that theory at all? About they lose, tr when the lights are moving, they're only getting a few seconds of light going back and forth, it's pretty slow. They're not attracted to it enough or they can't locate where the light source is because it's constantly moving on them. So again, you know, we're, we're looking at this with these lights. We want to be 10 weeks ahead of everybody else on thrip control, okay? That we really want to be there because it's what we call a community of competing ecologies. And it's really simple what I mean by that. We've got a lot of different things living in that greenhouse, you know, ranging from honeybees, you know, who just live in there because they can, uh, to natural predators, to mites, to thrips, to all this stuff. And the reality is, somebody's eating somebody. Okay, they're insects. That's what they do. You know, they're gonna, you know, you get, you're, you're living in some place and you're hungry, you're gonna try somebody on for size. You know, that's, that's how it's gonna work. I do wanna mention sanitation. Okay, I have pushed that several times today in this talk. Sanitation is the key before you do anything else. If you want to get rid of insect and disease pressures, clean up, okay? No plant debris can be allowed to stay in your tunnel or in your greenhouse ever. You just can't allow that stuff to sit there because you will have insects living on that stuff and you'll have diseases living on that stuff. You have to get rid of the dirt. You have to especially the pet banana tree. And then Alex rails on me constantly about this because I've got some plants that were my dad's and you know, it's like it's really emotional for me and all that kind of stuff that are, that are insect vectors, you know? And it's, it's got no place, you know? And don't throw them away. Uh, <laughs> but it's got no place in there. So we had a lecture series where I showed pictures of the, the pretty greenhouse, and then I said, and this is taken here, and this is not gonna happen again. If you wanna tick me off, walk past a weed, or leave dirt behind where you are. And again, you know, this is that uh, disgusting weed euphorbia that gets everywhere, 
And, uh, you know, if, if there's moisture somewhere, it will grow there. And if there's no moisture, it will grow there. And, uh, you know, so these are the kind of things that you've got to get rid of, okay? Yes. Uh, the question was about Encarcia Formosa for white fly control. Uh, we use uh, Encarcia a lot, all year round, of course. Um, it's not completely your be all end all because there's more than one type of white fly. So the other type of white fly is affected by Eretmoceros mundus, uh, and there's a third one uh, as well. And uh, so it's not, you have to identify, again, it's just like with any insect, you've got to identify which one you got. There's greenhouse white fly and there's silverleaf white fly. And uh, they're, they're very, very different uh, animals altogether. Different control for each one. Uh, over there. Yes, with the bird cherry oak aphid yes. makers, I was sort of missing when we stop protecting them from the predators and when we let the Okay, you, you stop protecting them when they're covered with aphids and you want to put them out in the greenhouse to be attacked by predators. And about how long before you need another round to take its place? So basically, week one, I will seed baskets of, of the grasses, keep them covered. Then week two, I take either the aphids that I have purchased or the colony that I saved from the previous week, cut it up, and transplant it into those baskets that I now have one week old grass in them. And then I will keep those covered, grow them on for another week. And all it takes is about a week for the colony of aphids to completely cover that whole pot. And then I open those up, select my best one, keep that aside, and transplant it to the next round. Uh, eventually, it'll always get contaminated, and then the idiot will find a way in, and you've got to uh, purchase a new colony. But uh, it's, about, it's about two weeks. So it's one week where I just grow the grass, Are you asking about weed control? Well, not, but like if, you know, I'm pulling weeds as I can, but like you're saying, there's hardly bugs. And Correct. It's hard to keep it sanitary. Okay, so there are a number of predators that will live in your floor. Um, I don't remember what the new name of the, is it the, the uh, Athena? Athena. So it's uh, something like Cyatopidus, Coronaria, or something like that. Athena is what we, what we, I grew up knowing it as. It's a rogue beetle and you release them on the floor of your greenhouse, and they are, they are wonderful. You, you only have to do it once or twice, okay, because they will be everywhere. Uh, they're, I mean, and you'll see them. You know, you'll pick up a flat, and you'll see them go running away. Uh, they're long, they're, they're little black and narrow things, and they're fast. So they really are aggressive hunters on, in a situation like that. Uh, there's no downside to uh, drenching your floor with the beneficial nematodes if you're looking for some thrip control and fungus that control. Uh, and then there is another, there's a predatory mite. Um, again, they've changed the name of this. I know it as Phytocelius persimilis. Hypoaspis. Hypoaspis uh, persimilis. Hypoaspis persimilis is for spider mites. I'm sorry, so Hypoaspis miles uh, is the name of that one. And uh, they're a, a soil living predatory mite as well. So there are definitely things that you can do on the floor of your greenhouse. Thank you. Yeah. But get rid of those weeds. Yes. Get rid of those weeds.